We have the opportunity today to hear about the views of candidates for Oregon's first congressional seat in the United States Congress. Candidates participating in this deb debate are Congresswoman Elizabeth First. Thank you. And her, and her opponent, Bill Witt. Let me describe today's program. It will have several sections. First, each candidate will give a three-minute opening statement. A coin toss held last week determined the order of appearance in the debate. Following the opening statements, candidates will respond to questions from our City Club panel. Our questions today are from a member of the program committee, Louise Tippins, who is here at the front table, and a member of the governing board of the club, Susan Stone, who is also here. Questions were submitted in advance of the meeting in writing by members of the City Club of Portland. A special subcommittee from the City Club Program Committee has selected the questions you'll hear today. These are the only questions that will be asked today. There will be no questions from the floor. The candidates have not seen these questions in advance. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to the question. Our timer again, uh, Jolene Klassen will assist us in moving the program forward. Following the panel questions, we will have three cross questions from the candidates themselves. Following that cross questioning, we will return to the City Club panel for a final series of questions. And that will end, bring us to the end of the debate, which is a three minute closing statement from each candidate. The meeting uh, is governed by the program format I've just described and by the rules of conduct which are displayed on all of your tables. The program uh, will adjourn about between 1.15 and 1.30. And now let me introduce today's speakers. Oregon's first congressional district is a compact unit of primarily four counties in northwest Oregon along with small portions of Clackamas and Multnomah counties, including the west side of downtown Portland. A drive through this relatively small area reveals a wide span of economic, social, and political interests. From the urban density of West Portland, through the explosive residential and industrial development of Washington County, the vineyards of Yamhill County, it covers both the currently busy marine activity of the lower Columbia ports from Portland to Astoria, and a shrinking rural population. And it ends, if you will, going in that direction on the Oregon coast with its fisheries and timber industries in transition. The Almanac of American Politics for 1994, issued by the National Journal in Washington, D.C., says this about the political history of the first district. Like Oregon, the first district is historically New England Republican, electing only Republican congressmen from 1892 to 1972. Like New England, it then trended to the left on cultural issues, even as its high-tech economy brought new affluence, and since 1974, it has been Democratic. Currently representing the district in her first term is Congresswoman Elizabeth Furse. She's a member of three House committees, the Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs Committee, the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee. During her term, Congresswoman First has authored and sponsored legislation in such issue areas as the environment, defense, and nuclear weapons. She's been active in efforts to fund West Side Light Rail and other key projects affecting the district. Born in Kenya of British parents, she was raised in South Africa and moved to this country as a young woman, becoming a U.S. citizen in 1972. She holds a bachelor's degree from Evergreen State College. Congresswoman First has been a citizen activist for many years, lobbying causes on behalf of Native American tribes, low-income workers, world peace, and national spending priorities. 
Bill Witt is president of Witco Systems, a company marketing graphic equipment and printing machinery in four western states and employing some 65 persons. Bill has been active in Republican politics, acting as co-chair of the Oregon delegation to the Republican National Committee in 1992, and as a member of the steering committee for the Oregon Bush Quail Campaign. He's a member of several civic organizations in Oregon, including the World Affairs Council and the Tiger and Hillsborough Chambers of Commerce. He serves as a board member of the Edgefield Children's Center. Mr. Witt is a graduate of University of Chicago Law School and a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Case Western University in Cleveland. He's a resident of Washington County where he lives with his wife and two sons. I would now like to ask each of our speakers to approach the podium and begin with the opening statements. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Elizabeth First and Bill Witt to the Portland City Club. begin with an opening uh, statement from Bill Witt, Bill Witt, excuse me, followed by that of Congresswoman First. Thank you. I'd like to thank the City Club for hosting this debate to give both uh, Congresswoman First and myself an opportunity to present our views. Uh, before I start, I would like to introduce my wife, Gail, and my son, Eric, who are with us. If, if you'd stand up, please. Eric has the day off from school, so he could join us. Two years ago, Elizabeth First said she wanted to go to Congress because she, quote, wanted to change the way business is done in Washington. I think this election is a referendum. Has Elizabeth First really brought change to our country? Let's look at her commitment. Taxes. Two years ago, she said Washington doesn't need more money. We need to be more efficient with the dollars we have. She said that right up to Election Day. Yet she turned around after she had been in the Congress less than 45 days and provided the decisive vote on a huge tax increase, almost $250 billion, including over $800 million from taxpayers in the first congressional district. It's a tax increase that affected seniors, everybody that uses an automobile or gasoline, and many, many small business people throughout this district. Spending. Have we really controlled the growth in spending in Washington? Elizabeth First has proposed $594 billion in new spending and the National Taxpayers Union gives her an F and ranks her 32nd out of 435 in proposed new spending. Supporting small business. Has Elizabeth First helped small business? Well, the NFIB, the largest small business organization in the United States, doesn't think so. She ranks zero with them, and they've endorsed my candidacy. Enhancing trade. This is a district in a state that depends greatly on free trade and the opportunities to trade our products around the world. Elizabeth first failed the test when she voted against NAFTA. Balanced budget amendment, when it had a real chance to pass, it lost by only 12 votes. It didn't have Elizabeth first's support. Crime, Elizabeth first has a record of putting the rights of the criminal over the rights of the victim. Healthcare, she supports a single payer system that will take away your right to choose the type of health insurance that's right for you and your family. More government, more government control of our lives. In congressional reform, Elizabeth first claims to be for it, but she refuses to sign a discharge petition to get term limits to the floor where it can be debated and voted on. When the opportunity to apply family and medical leave laws to the Congress came up, she voted no. It's okay to apply it to small business, but not to the Congress, and she's voted against cutting the bureaucracy. I have an alternative vision of tax relief for families and lower income individuals and small business, cutting wasteful spending, by keeping more of our dollars here at home where we can deal with our social problems more effectively, preserving health care choice, enhancing small business trade and transportation, fighting crime by going after criminals, not the law abiding, and real congressional reform. I think it's time that Elizabeth first be held accountable for her votes, which are a failure to bring real change to our country. Thank you. Ms. First. Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. Just two years ago, I stood before you to tell you how I would change Congress if you would send me there. I'm here today to give you a report card on those two years. I'm going to ask you to support me to go back and finish the job. The good news is 
The good news is that one person really can make a difference if you're really focused, if you work hard, and you care deeply about the issues, and you have to be independent. I said I would work to cut wasteful spending. I said I'd look especially at the Pentagon. I said the savings should go to new priorities. They should go to the things that matter to us, to education, promoting our industries worldwide so that we can complete, compete in a global market. Well, I'm the only member in the Congress whose amendments have cut wasteful Pentagon spending in each of the last two years. I fought to make Europe pay its defense costs, and my amendments cut Star Wars and eliminated bureaucratic waste in the Pentagon, and those savings went to the lower the deficit. I am proud to say that of 435 members of Congress, I'm 38 in voting to cut spending. I voted, voted for $450 billion in cuts. And the deficit in those two years has gone down 40%. I said I wanted to help Oregon's businesses flourish, and I've worked with many of you here in this room to promote the voice of Oregon's business, to cut unnecessary regulations and red tape. I'm proud to have helped Kraft the Acquisition Reform Act, which passed, and to be endorsed today in my race by the Oregon Bankers Association. I said that I was sick of violence on our streets, sick of violence in our homes. I co-sponsored and I voted for the Brady Bill and the assault weapon ban. I authored, along with Senator Mark Hatfield, the Domestic Violence Community Initiative Act, and we fought to get it in, the crime bill, it got in, it passed. I fought for truth in sentencing, like Oregon's truth in sentencing. They got in the crime bill, I voted for the crime bill. I am proud today to be endorsed by the Oregon police chiefs for safer communities. I said I'd help promote education so that our kids could have an education second to none. I co-sponsored education to make Oregon have flexibility with federal funding. I'm endorsed by the Oregon Education Association. I said I'd work hard for West Side Light Rail, and with Senator Hatfield, we got the second highest funding each of two years. And most importantly at all, I, of all, I said I would vote, I would work, to keep a woman's right to choose. I'm a co-sponsor of the Freedom of Choice Act. I say keep government out of our bedrooms and out of our doctor's offices. Thank you. Thanks to both the candidates, and we will now move to the portion of the program which consists of questions from our City Club panel. I'll turn the program over to the panelists, Susan Stone and Louise Tippins. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to the question asked, after which the other candidate will have one minute to rebut. The first question for Mr. Witt will come from Susan Stone. Mr. Witt, the last Congress in large part failed to enact most of its environmental agenda, including the Safe Drinking Water Act and Superfund. In your opinion, what was wrong with each of these bills? I don't know that there was anything wrong with either of the bills. Um, I think we, the problem we have in Congress is we have people that go there sometimes with a very, very firm ideological agenda. And they get wedded to particular interests. And instead of working for what is right for the American people, they start following a particular ideology that's supported by particular interests that help, have helped fund their campaigns. What we need to do in Congress is we need to work to end the special interests and the partisanship and get people to start working together in a balanced way to best represent the interests of the American people. And that's what I want to do in Congress. I want to work for environmental reform, cleaner air and cleaner water, preserving our heritage and our natural resources, and at the same time looking for ways in which we can do these things affordably and protect good jobs that exist here in, in Oregon. 
When I went to Congress, I said I would work to very hard to try and stop gridlock. The Clean Water Act is one that really protects Oregon's waters. Uh, it is protective of our industry because it allows us to have the kind of economy, the kind of uh, place to be that attracts Oregon's businesses. Uh, I will work hard to end gridlock. It's not always uh, possible to get 435 people to agree, but you can certainly work together as I have worked with Senator Mark Hatfield and other people on both sides of the aisle to try and see that we get, like my uh, stream restoration bill, a way where you have a win-win situation, private and public working together to protect and enhance our environment. We use a question for Ms. Spurs. Congresswoman first. Last week, the Washington Post editorialized that this will go into the record books as perhaps, perhaps the worst Congress, least effective, most destructive, nastiest in 50 years. As a member of this Congress, what are your observations about its accomplishments? Well, I think that, uh, quite frankly, a lot of things did get accomplished. We had a budget which reduced the deficit for the very first time three years in a row since Harry Truman was in the White House. The deficit went down. We had a budget which allowed 16,000 people in this district get a tax rebate. So that's a good thing. Uh, we had interest rates go down as a result of work that this Congress did. We passed family and medical leave. That means that a person who wants to stay home, look after a relative or a child, and not worry about losing their job, they can do that. That was, that was excellent for, our, for the, the workers and the people in this community. We did a lot of other things that I'm very proud of. We put caps on spending. We have the lowest spending of GDP in 30 years because we put caps on spending and we held to those caps and we said if we're going to do extra spending we're going to have to find the money to reprogram. So I think there were lots of accomplishments in this Congress and there's lots more to do. I think we need to move on to the rebuttal. I think this Congress was a tremendous failure and I think that the, the Washington Post is right. Specifically we had the the greatest opportunity in the last 10 to 15 years to pass a balanced budget amendment. It missed by 12 votes. Remember that balanced budget amendment needed two-thirds of the votes in the House, and it got very close to it. But certain people in the Congress, including a lot of freshman Democrats, and Elizabeth First was one of them, was too beholden to the leadership that has thrived on having the American people spend more and more dollars and, and take more and more tax dollars and do more and more federal spending rather than doing the things the American people want, which is cutting spending. The second thing that it failed to do is it failed to pass term limits. Despite all the rhetoric, people running for office saying they want term limits, the people of Oregon have spoken out on the need for term limits two years ago through the initiative process. Once again, we have a failure for term limits because people who talk about being in favor of term limits refuse to sign discharge petitions where it's gonna to get to the floor and be voted on. I think this, this Congress was not accountable to the American people, and many of its members were more accountable to the leadership in the Congress instead of their own constituents. Susan? Mr. Witt, because this is your first bid for elective office, many people really don't know much about your political philosophy. What points of view do you share with David Fronmeyer, Denny Smith, or Mark Hotfield? Well, I think I, I think I share certain points with all of them. and. Uh, by the way, all three of those candidates and, and public officials are people in the past who I have contributed to and, and supported in their campaigns for Congress. I have a belief in limited government. I believe that the Constitution laid out 220 years ago that particularly the federal government had certain rights and certain responsibilities, and they were limited in nature. And the thing that I am most concerned with over the last 30 or 40 years is the tremendous growth in the federal government and how it's undermined our opportunities here in Oregon and in our own communities and in our own homes to effectively deal with problems that are better dealt with at a local level. So I think with all three of those people, I believe in limited government. I believe in a respect for private business and individual property rights and individual rights. And I believe in terms of respecting a balance between the responsibilities of state and local government and the federal government. Well, I have worked very closely with Senator Mark Hatfield on issues of justice, on issues of peace. Uh, he and I have co-sponsored a number of pieces of legislation, the um, 
Community uh, Domestic Violence Assistance Act and uh, the, uh, the other acts that we have put together. But I think with he and I, we have a long history of working together for Oregon. Uh, we believe that Oregon is not an ideological state. It is a state where Republicans and Democrats can work together. Dame Fronmeyer and I have recently been working on the bone marrow uh, initiative, which is to make sure that there is a registry around the country for bone marrow transplants for children who might be tragically affected by diseases that need a bone marrow transplant. Uh, I think that uh, Danny Smith and I have only one thing in common, and that is that he was against the York gun, and I am too. <laughs> Congresswoman first, current speaker Tom Foley doesn't seem to be cut from the same bolt of cloth as Tip O'Neill, Sam Rayburn, and other legendary House speakers. If he survives his re-election bid, why should Mr. Foley continue serving as speaker next year? Well, I've only had uh, the opportunity to serve under one speaker. I have heard of the legendary uh, things that happened under uh, other speakers. I've heard of people who actually, members of Congress, who actually went to the bathroom and sat up in the stalls because they were so afraid the speaker <laughs> would come and get them if they didn't vote right. But I'm not sure of that, because I'm, I'm, obviously Mr. Foley doesn't come into the stall. Um, <laughs> Tom Foley is a man who I think believes very deeply in uh, supporting the Pacific Northwest. He has worked hard on issues uh, for his district, including keeping a base open in his district. I don't know his district well. I have worked under him, and I have actually found him a very fair man. Uh, he's been very fair. He's, I've not always agreed with him. We've not always uh, found things that we actually voted completely with on uh, together, although he did change his vote on assault weapon ban, and so then we were together on that, and we were together on the crime bill, and that was wonderful. Uh, so I, I can't tell you what another speaker would be like. I just know Mr. Foley. Well, I think a congressman, particularly a Speaker of the House, who will sue the own state and the people that he represents because he doesn't like their determination on term limits obviously has a problem. And I think it explains why Tom Foley right now is in the fight of his life and really should be replaced by the people of Spokane. Um, and if you, look at, if you look at the Congress for the last 40 years and you look at the leadership control and you look at what's happened to our country over those last 40 years, you can see where the problem is that these are people who believe in more and more power and taking more and more of your dollars, taking them into Washington where they can use them and decide how to spend them because they think they better know how to use your dollars than you do. Tom Foley characterizes that. And I might point out that Elizabeth First has voted with the House leadership, Tom Foley, Dan Rostenkowski, Henry Gonzalez and such, 99% of the time on bills where the leadership has taken a position. We need to break that kind of leadership. We need new leadership in the House, Republican leadership. Mm -hmm. Mr. Witt, please set your record straight about your sympathies for the Oregon Citizens Alliance and your financial support for this organization. Have you contributed to the OCA, and do you endorse its political goals? Okay, thank you. In 1990, I contributed roughly $1,500 to the Oregon Citizens Alliance to use for Measure 8, which was their pro-life initiative that year. And I also contributed to Right to Life for their Measure 10, which was a pro-life initiative. You know, I've made my views on abortion very clear. I've made perfectly clear my personal convictions that we have a right and a responsibility to defend innocent human life. And that is the extent of my involvement of ever providing any support to the Oregon Citizens Alliance. I have not been involved in their last initiatives, Measure 9 in 1992, nor their measure this year. Um, and I have not offered any support for those initiatives whatsoever. I come from a country uh, where people were set against each other, divided. And uh, I cannot bear to think that Oregon will continue with this divisive program of the Oregon Citizens Alliance. I believe that we as Oregonians all together should be together solving the problems that are Oregon's. I have no, I could never do anything but repudiate 
any kind of support from the Oregon Citizens Alliance. First. Try to limit our applause so that we can be sure to get through the entire debate. Yes, go ahead. With the Democrats controlling not only both houses of Congress, but also the executive branch, it's hard to understand why your party has been unable to pass more of its own legislation this year, from environmental measures to election reform. Why is your party having such a hard time exercising the power that you clearly have? Well, you know, I think that's a fabulous question because uh, this is a country that was built with a system that says we have to compromise to get to what our goal is. What were the goals of the Democratic Party in this year, in this uh, session? Well, I think some of the goals were to, in fact, make sure that workers had a safer environment to work in. I think we did that with uh, family and medical leave. I think that helped our workers make sure that they felt comfortable in the workplace. Was NAFTA a democratic bill? It passed, but I think it was, in fact, a Republican and democratic bill. What other issues were big on the, on the Democratic agenda? Well, health care reform was big on the Democratic agenda. And I think it was big on the Democratic and the Republican agenda because it was to try and solve the problems that face us today. Did we get health care reform? No, because we couldn't get people to agree. And yet, can we come back and get health care reform? Indeed. We will pass the agenda next year. The, the Clinton administration has, has pursued some of its strategic policy initiatives strictly on a partisan basis. We saw it in 1993 with the budget bill, which brought about the tax increase, which passed by one vote without any Republican support at all. We saw it in health care, where they, through secret meetings with so-called experts, this health care plan was dreamed up, Republicans were kept out of the process, and then suddenly the plan is presented and Republicans are supposed to accept it. The reality of it is that the Clinton administration has only worked to be bipartisan when it absolutely depended upon it to get bills through, such as with the crime bill as a good example, and such as with the NAFTA vote, which is another good example. When there really was a bipartisan effort, such as Penny Kasich, where Republicans and Democrats were working together in the Congress to bring real change, the administration opposed them. The problem of partisanship really rests with the Democratic leadership and it rests with President Clinton. Thank you. Before we uh, move on to the next uh, section of the program, please let me ask uh, heads forth to hold your applause till the end. We're on Oregon Public Broadcasting and giving the listeners there and everyone here an opportunity to hear all of the views. I think will uh, keep us moving along without that. So if you'd hold that uh, from now until the end of the program, that would be very helpful. We'll move to the opportunity for each of the candidates to ask the other a question. And there will be three questions from each candidate. The question must be asked in 30 seconds, and the opponent will have one minute to respond, after which the questioner may then come back for a 30-second optional rebuttal. And we'll uh, alternate, obviously, the role of the questioner. We'll begin with Mr. Witt, your first question for Ms. Burst. All right, thank you. Elizabeth, last year you voted against NAFTA, despite the fact that most Oregonians supported NAFTA and that Oregon as a state is heavily dependent upon trade. The initial results of NAFTA are very encouraging, with increasing trade and investment between the United States and Canada and Mexico. Given these positive results, are you now prepared to admit that your vote was a mistake, and why or why not? I think that what Oregonians want when they send a representative to Congress is somebody who makes careful, independent decisions. I studied NAFTA. I thought it was a bad treaty. I'm for fair trade, but I thought that NAFTA was a bad agreement because although we worked to get the labor and the, si and the environmental agreements in, they didn't get into the final bill. Now, I have worked on another trade issue. That is most favored nation status for China. I thought that that was an issue where we could really get a benefit to Oregon's businesses. That was a place where we could increase our trade with 
the Asian countries. I am now in the middle of uh, studying very carefully the GATT agreement, an agreement that we have been in for 40 years, but we have a new vote on. And I voted actually on uh, last Friday on the rule, the, one of the, uh, the rules which um, we have to pass to get bills to the floor. And uh, I voted to bring that bill to the floor. Thank you. Well, of course, you didn't answer my question. I was asking you if you think your NAFTA vote was a mistake or not. I think the reality, and the public record shows this, that within 60 days of your vote against NAFTA, you received over $100,000 in contributions from unions and environmental groups that wanted you to vote against NAFTA. And I think it shows that you value that relationship more than doing what was right for your constituency. Ms. Bruce, your first question to Mr. Witt. Mr. Witt, you have said that you support this contract, which was authored by your congressional leadership. It calls for increasing Pentagon spending, cutting taxes on the rich, and it is paid for with cuts in Social Security and Medicare. How do you support a contract that cuts programs for seniors? Well, first of all, let's set the record straight. The contract with America does not cut programs such as Social Security or Medicare for seniors. That's a nice democratic spin. It's not the truth. You know, I've looked at the contract. It has exactly the things in it that I've been talking about for the last, the last year, the things that need to be changed in our country, and I support all of it. And let me tell you very quickly what it is. A balanced budget amendment that is relied on spending cuts, not increases. Locking up violent criminals. Reforming welfare so that people can get in a position to help themselves instead of continually being dependent on government. Protecting our children and giving greater parental control and authority in education. Easing the tax burden on families. Making sure we have a defense that is second to none that can protect our interests around the world. Tax relief for senior citizens, not increases that Elizabeth first supported. Slashing red tape and bureaucracy. Stopping frivolous lawsuits by making losers in lawsuits pay the legal costs of the winner and term limits to do something about our problem with career politicians. I think that's the right agenda for America, and I'm proud to support it. Thank you. Well, Mr. Witt, independent analysts disagree with you. The New York Times says the contract will cost taxpayers over $800 billion and will result in slicing Social Security. Business Week called it a reprise of pie in the supply sky side sky eco economics, and USA Today called it a budget tricks and gimmicks with a, th a trillion dollar hole in it. Mr. Witt, your second okay. question. During this campaign, you have um, talked about being a friend of the taxpayer and a friend of small business owners. In fact, you've even made up spending reduction lists that don't even exist, and you've attributed them to the National Taxpayers Union. But let's look at what small business and pro-taxpayer organizations report about your record. The National Taxpayers Union gives you an F, and it ranks you 32nd in net new spending proposals. They've endorsed me. The National Federation of Independent Business has given you a zero. They've endorsed me. The Concord Coalition has given you an F in their efforts to do something about the deficit. Are all of these pro-business, pro-taxpayer organizations wrong, or are you misrepresenting your real record? You know, Mr. Witt, I am so proud of my record in Congress. I stand by my record. Uh, I do think that you do tend a little bit to uh, distort my record, but let's see who are supporting uh, me, which are the organizations that are supporting me. Well, there's Bank of America, the Business and Professional Women's Association, the Oregon Bankers Association, the Independent Re in Americans for Responsible Biz Government, the Independent Bankers, the Human Rights Campaign Fund. I could go on and on. Let me say that my record is clear. I am 38th biggest spending cutter, voted for, third, at 38th of 435, voting for cuts, and uh, I am actually 100, 241 in the National Taxpayers Union group. That's just right up besides Congressman Bob Smith. Well, the reality, of course, when you heard those organizations supporting this first, you heard bankers, I think, four times. It's not coincidental that she sits on the banking committee, the same bankers who two years ago supported Tony Meeker. But of course, politics have a way of working their way around. The National Taxpayers Union, which, which Ms. First loves to quote, 
has given her an F. They've came out and they endorsed me as the very first candidate in the United States they endorsed. And the real records are that she is number 32 out of 435 in proposed new spending. I have the list here. I'll make it available to anybody that wants to see it. $594 billion in new proposed spending. First or second question? Uh, Mr. Witt, I do not believe that the government should be in our bedrooms or in our doctor's offices. I trust women to make these personal and private decisions. That's why I co-sponsored and fought for the Freedom of Choice Act. If elected to represent the men and the women of Oregon's first district, how will you vote on the Freedom of Choice Act? Well, of course, this is a question you asked me before, and I'll respond again. I will vote against the Freedom of Choice Act, and I will vote against the Freedom of Choice Act because it takes away the rights of people here in Oregon to pass laws that are constitutionally permissible to regulate abortion in ways that they feel is right, such as parental notification or informed consent or third trimester bans on abortion. The Freedom of Choice Act makes it so that here in Oregon, we can't pass those laws even if we want to, and it gives that authority to Washington. Now, I've been clear on the abortion issue. I've been clear in terms of my pro-life beliefs. And I've been clear that I believe these issues should be dealt with at the level of state government, not federal government. But Elizabeth first keeps changing. In fact, Project Vote Smart, she answered their questionnaire, and here's their phone number, 1-800-622-SMART. Anybody can call it. She now says she's in favor of abortion for the first trimester only. She said it on August 22nd in Newburgh during a debate. It appeared in the Oregonian. And she answered Project Vote Smart's questionnaire with the exact same response. She keeps changing on abortion, and I don't think people like that kind of flip-flopping. Yes. Um, you know, we have to keep government out of these choices. I'm pro-choice. I've always been pro-choice. That means I trust women to make these decisions in concert with their doctors and their families. Mr. Witt, your third question. Yes, in a recent taxpayer paid targeted mailing in your district, you claimed to be tough on crime. In fact, you made repeated references to protecting women, children, and families from violence. Given these claims, how do you justify your vote to keep secret the identity of convicted sexual predators when they are tried for subsequent sexual offenses? Furthermore, I would point out that your vote was opposed by nearly 90% of the House members, including the great majority of Democrats. Mr. Witt, you keep distorting my record. On the issue of sexual predators, I voted not once, but twice on that issue. Once when we put it in the House Crime Bill, it was sponsored by Susan Molinari, and we sent it over to the Senate. They weakened it. It came back to the House floor. We voted again. And so for a second time, I voted on the issue of sexual predators. But let me tell you, I am tough on crime. I'm very tough on crime. I think we have to keep violent criminals off the streets. I think we have to keep military assault weapons off the streets. I think we have to protect our families and our police. And that's why I'm so pleased to be endorsed by the Oregon police chiefs for safer communities and to have voted for a tough, fair crime bill. Well, you know, the Molinari Amendment, you voted against, and I appreciate your admitting it. If you flip-flop later, I mean, that's a matter of public record as well. But when this came up in the House specifically, you voted against it. You were one of a very small minority, and it's consistent with your positions with college scholarships for felons, for wanting to end mandatory sentence guidelines for drug offenders and other votes that you've taken in the House. And by the way, I just recently was endorsed by the largest and biggest law enforcement agency in the United States, the Law Enforcement Alliance of America. Ms. Burst, your final question. Mr. Witt, you have recently been endorsed by the Oregon Citizens Alliance. That alliance's agenda over the last six years has been to promote extremist ballot measures which seek to divide Oregonians. Tell us today, which part of the Oregon Citizens Alliance agenda, if any, do you disagree with? And please be specific. Well, well first, let's set the record straight. I have not been endorsed by them. 
They endorsed me in the primary. I talked with them subsequent to that, and I told them I really didn't want their endorsement, and they told me they would not give it to me. I saw, I saw recently where they published a list of recommended candidates, of which there were about 50 of them, that my name was on there. Okay, I have told them I did not want their endorsement. If they publish a list of recommended candidates, that's their business. Um, as far as the Oregon Citizens Alliance, there's certain things such as family tax relief, their pro-life positions, there's certain positions that I'm generally in support of, there are others that I do not support. What we'd like Please. to know is uh, why then did you send them money? You sent them hundreds of dollars of money and you lent them business equipment and Mr. Witt, you are endorsed by the Oregon Citizens Alliance. We'll now return to the City Club panel for a last round of questions uh, to both of the candidates and beginning with Susan Stone to Mr. Witt. Mr. Witt, since Congress failed to pass health care reform this year, it will be back on next year's agenda. What form of health care reform legislation would you support? I support a number of reforms that I think can help lower the cost and open up in health insurance for more people. Number one, we need tax changes that will allow people who buy their own insurance or the self-employed to deduct the cost of those premiums from their income for tax purposes. Right now that opportunity exists for employers, it does not exist for the employee. Number two, I support medical malpractice reform that will help limit the enormous cost that we have today with defensive medicine. Third, I support insurance reform that will ensure and protect the right of someone to take their health insurance from one job to the next or between jobs to keep the insurance that they have. I support helping moderate income individuals buy qualifying health insurance with the use of some vouchers that will consist of some assistance from taxpayer dollars. I think these kinds of reforms allow people to make good choices with their own dollars and with some assistance and helps open, open up the health insurance market for more people without letting the government come in and totally dominate the health care market. One minute for rebuttal. I support health care reform that will do a number of things. It must be have universal coverage to reduce costs. You can't get the reduction in costs without the universal coverage. It must be portable. If you have it in Portland, Oregon, you're going to have to be able to have it in Portland, Maine. It's got to definitely be, have the physician, your choice of physician, part of it. It must have your choice of physician. It must include all pre-existing conditions. We can no longer have people who are uh, being prevented from health care because they have a pre-existing condition. And it must protect seniors. Congresswoman Please. first. In your opinion, is the media being unusually intolerant and hypercritical of President Clinton and his administration? Or does the President deserve the criticisms that he is an indecisive, unfocused, and ineffective outsider? Well, I was really amused. Um, I went to the inauguration. It was a wonderful, incredible party. And uh, 11 days after the inauguration, I read a headline in the Washington Post 11 days after the inauguration, and the headline said, where's the change? <laughs> I thought that was a little harsh. Um, I think that anybody who runs for office, anybody at all who accepts the, the tremendous responsibility of office, must be open to the most intense scrutiny. I think uh, that Mr. Clinton has done some very good things. I think he's done some things I didn't agree with. But that's what our, our form of government is. We elect people, we scrutinize them, and then we ask them to do a good job. Well, I think you summarized it well. I can't remember ex the exact adjectives, but I think they worked very well. We can remember Bill Clinton running as a new Democrat, middle class tax cut. And what did we get? He was in office less than 30 days, and he came out and proposed a major tax increase. I think Bill Clinton's problem is Bill Clinton and the way he's gone about trying to bring about bigger and bigger government, radical changes in health care that undermine the rights of the people and that are opposed by the people. And at the same time, he's opposed all sorts of governmental reforms and congressional reform that the people want. 
I think Bill Clinton has shown himself to be one who believes in bigger and bigger government and higher taxes and more control of our lives, even though that isn't what the American people want. And at the bottom line, I think his problems are public policy problems, that he is supporting the wrong agenda for America and the American people know it, and that's why his approval ratings have sunk down below 40%. Mr. Witt, the United States military is once again engaged in the Middle East, in a, I'm sorry, engaged in the Middle East between Iraq and Kuwait. Do you support the President's decision to deploy troops and what long-term solution to the problems in this region should the United States pursue? I think the uh, recent developments uh, in Iraq and in the Middle East once again point out that we live in a very dangerous world. It was just three and a half years ago that we had to send over an enormous amount of, of men and machinery and equipment and technology to be able to drive the Iraqis out of Kuwait and protect the free flow of oil out of the Middle East. I think the situation in Korea a few months ago, which is still ongoing and is not resolved, shows the tremendous dangers that exist in the world today. I support President Clinton's effort to be prepared in case there is an attack in the Middle East. And I think the best preparation to avoid war, to avoid attacks, is to have military preparedness and technology available that can defend our legitimate interests around the world. I think the defense cuts that we have had over the last three or four years have, are starting to go too far, and they're undermining our ability to protect our legitimate critical interests around the world. And I don't want to get back into a situation like we were in in the late 70s and early 80s when America wasn't in a position where it could defend its legitimate interests. Rebuttal. Well, serving as I do on the House Armed Services Committee, obviously this is an issue of tremendous concern. Uh, I think that uh, the, the Joint Chiefs have made a clear decision that they need to bring up men and material and women and material up uh, close to the front. Now, there's a very big difference but by, between preparedness and getting into an armed conflict. My position has always been, and I have spoken to the President on this, my position has always been that we need to pursue every, every opportunity for conflict resolution, as happened, of course, in the Haitian situation. We moved to that last conflict resolution. We were able to stop an armed invasion. I think, though, that it is up to the people who represent the people of this country to discuss those issues of national security when we are not ex actually under attack. Therefore, I think it will be very, it would be right for the President to come to the Congress when we are once again in session to have a full discussion. I think the President acted swiftly. I think he is working with a multinational group. We need to continue our multinational responses to world problems. Thank you. Louise? Congresswoman, first. Your congressional district ranges from a dense urban downtown Portland to rural resource-dependent communities. What issues do these voters have in common, and how are you addressing them? Well, everybody has the issue of a concern about jobs, concern to protect the quality of life in Oregon. That is very high on every poll and on everybody who writes to me. Another enormous issue before the people of, of the first district is the opportunity to get college loans. You know, we hear all these other issues that are out in front of us, but the letters I get, the people are most interested in, how do I get to college? And I was very pleased we were able to increase college loans, and we were also, also able to make them more uh, easy to get. Business. I, uh, in, I authored a bill called the Environmental Export Assistance Act. It was signed by the President yesterday. Uh, what it does is it uh, promotes our businesses worldwide. We need to be a global business and a global society. We need to educate our children so they compete globally. That's something people are concerned about. We need to make sure that our businesses are healthy and able to be part of this great growing global economy. Susan? I get, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, I, I find it interesting that Ms. First would make the comments about jobs when she has absolutely turned her back on many natural resource sectors of our economy here in Oregon. Just yesterday, I was up at the Boise Cascade plant up in St. Helens. I met with over, uh, talked to over 500 of the employees up there, most of them Democrats and most of them union members, who absolutely do not understand why their congresswoman will, would sponsor measures that will likely end them in their jobs. 
Um, I think we have a responsibility to protect good wage paying jobs in this district. We need to do it in a responsible, environmentally sound manner, but we can't turn our backs on the thousands of people who depend upon these types of jobs in this district. And when you talk about small business and we talk about the promotion of small business, more and more taxes such as a 7 to 8 percent payroll tax for health care, more and more controls and restrictions and regulations of small business is not going to help small business nor protect jobs here in Oregon. And I think Elizabeth First's record is one that has been anti-job, not pro-job. Mr. Witt, it could be argued that federal funding for the West Side Light Rail Project mm -hmm. and the Health Sciences Complex represents pork barrel politics and out of control federal spending. What is your opinion? Is it pork or is it support for worthwhile endeavors? I think there's certain projects that the federal government has a uh, needs to support local government in, and I think transportation is clearly one of those. You know, transportation is something that all of us benefit from. It benefits our economy, it helps in terms of the movement of goods and services, and I support West Side Light Rail, and I support the extension of light rail throughout the Portland area to make it more efficient for more people to use. I think that is a legitimate and a good uh, interest and responsibility of the federal government. I think the same applies to medical research and development of medical facilities which are going to serve all the people of Oregon, all the people of this district. Uh, I applaud Mark Hatfield's efforts in these areas and to the extent that Elizabeth First has helped in terms of light rail, I think it's a, a positive mark for her. I'm so glad to hear that you do support West Side Light Rail in Newburgh. Just the other day, you said it wouldn't do a damn bit of good for the people of Newburgh. Well, it does do a lot of good for all of us in Oregon. 1,600 new jobs, 1,600 new jobs in Oregon as a result of West Side Light Rail. We are fortunate to have a senator like Mark Hatfield that I've been able to work with to be able to say, he got, he pushed it in the Senate, I pushed it in the House, we got that funding. Definitely, we need West Side Light Rail because it extends the livability of our communities. Uh, Shirley Hoffman, the former mayor of Hillsborough, is to be congratulated for the great work she's done. And I was really pleased to get Oregon Transit Legislator of the Year Award for my work. We just got some funding for uh, the uh, hospital to do the research, this very needed research in the Veterans Hospital on Gulf War Syndrome. We send our folks off to war and then they come back with these diseases. We need to be there. Mark Hatfield and I worked hard to make sure that that is one of three research centers in the country. Thank you. Please. Okay, last question. Do you think members of of and candidates for federal office should speak out or avoid discussing their positions on state and local election issues? I think that unless it has a federal impact, it is uh, probably unwise to stand on issues. But there are some issues that transcend all, all state or, or local concerns. Ballot measure 13 is that. We fought it two years ago. We said, no, we will not divide Oregonians. I am unequivocally opposed to ballot measure 13. We need to bring Oregonians together to solve the problems before us. Well, that's, that's a real selective choosing. You know, I've, I've taken the position that I want to run my race on the things that Congress needs to be working on, the issues that are going to be coming before Congress and how that's going to impact the people of the 1st Congressional District and the people of Oregon. And that's a commitment that I'm going to maintain. And uh, because of that, with all the ballot measures that are up this year, I'm not taking specific positions on them, but any issue relating to any one of those issues as it could come before Congress, I'm more than happy to discuss. I know that Elizabeth First, when she was asked by the National Taxpayers Union if she would take a position on Measure 5, which is an anti-tax measure, thank you for a nice obscenity you just, you just whispered to me. Very nice, very tolerant. Would you please? Um, I, I know when the National Taxpayers Union asked Congresswoman first about that, she said, oh, no, I don't take positions on ballot measures. We're now completed with the questions from our panel, and we'll move to the closing statements and begin with Elizabeth first. Thank you. This is the race where the choices are very clear. My opponent and I are very, very different. We have different views on government. Here is the choice as I see it. You sent me to Washington to cut wasteful spending, and I have, especially in the Pentagon. But my opponent wants to increase Pentagon spending. 
You sent me to Washington to make our streets safer, provide more community police, get military-style guns off our streets, and I have. That's why I voted for the crime bill. My opponent says he would oppose the crime bill and the assault weapon ban. You sent me to Washington to protect a woman's right to choose. I have. I am a co-sponsor of the Freedom of Choice Act, and you know where my opponent stands. I believe that when anyone's rights are threatened, all of us are threatened. But my opponent supports and is supported by the Oregon Citizens Alliance. As a person who grew up in a country that was divided, divided by hatred, I know the dangers of bigotry and dividing people. I think about my mother who started the Black Sash in South Africa. I think about my grandmother who wanted to give women an opportunity to serve in the Navy and she started the Women's Royal Navy Service. In my family, I was taught the value of being part of the solution. Despite our many problems, I know, I know that one person can make a difference. But each of us must have to commit to solving problems. Only then can we achieve peace and justice and economic stability. Just look, just look at the last two years. Peace in Ireland, peace between Israel and Jordan, peace and justice in South Africa. Those things do not just happen on their own. They happen because people of goodwill choose to work together to work for the interests of all. I ask for your support on November 8th so that together we can, together, fulfill the dream, the promise, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I agree with Elizabeth first that there is a clear choice in this campaign. We can continue business as usual in Washington with higher taxes, bigger and bigger government programs and, and spending, diverting our rights and our responsibilities from citizens and government here at the local level and giving it to Washington, ineffective crime fighting that spends more and more pork barrel dollars that bring three police when we're committed, it's gonna, we're told it's going to bring hundreds, and a Congress as usual that's more interested in serving itself than in serving the people. The ra reality of the matter is that Elizabeth I has voted 99% of the time with the House leadership. It is a position that is anti-reform, it's anti-taxpayer, it's anti-small business, it's anti-senior citizens. I think what we need to do is we need real change. We need change of less government, family tax relief, small business tax relief, better hope and opportunity for our senior citizens. Catherine Weber, who's a state senator from south of here down in Marion County, who's running in the 5th District, recently was quoted as saying, Elizabeth is way out there to the left compared to me. I think she's also looked at Elizabeth versus record in the Congress. I want to work for real change with tax relief, protecting jobs, eliminating wasteful gym spending, pro-trade policies that are going to be good for all of us here in Oregon pro-transportation and pro-economic development. I've been endorsed by a broad-based organization such as the National Taxpayers Union, the National Federation of Independent Business, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Crime Victims United, the Associated General Contractors, and just recently the Law Enforcement Association of America. These are broad-based organizations that respect small business and the taxpayer and families and look for ways to make their life better. There are real differences between us, and I think it's summed up best in a quote from Abraham Lincoln from 1861. You cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot help the wage earner by pulling down the wage payer. You cannot further the brotherhood of man by encouraging class hatred. You cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. You cannot keep out of trouble by spending more than you earn. You cannot build character and courage by taking away a person's initiative and responsibility. You cannot help people permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. We need a government that empowers people, not that brings about more and more bureaucracy and higher and higher taxes and more and more big government programs at our expense. That's the real choice before us this year in this district. I ask for your vote and your support. Thank you very much.
Our thanks, our thanks to both the candidates for a crisp and lively debate, and we very much appreciate your Thank being you. here. Please join me in a final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.